Good evening, brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you tonight in the name of Jesus. Welcome to our ongoing revival and evangelistic series this evening. It is my prayer that you have experienced the goodness of God. Our God is good and is worthy of all our praises. His mercies are new every morning. And that does not mean that the mercies get old as the day goes by. But whatever the circumstances, on tomorrow morning, His mercies will be new again. And we can trust in the Lord for that. Let go of today. Whatever you did not accomplish for today, trust in the mercies of God for tomorrow and the grace of God for tomorrow as we start a new day with Him. For, for those who are joining us tonight for the first time, we welcome you, we ask you to feel at home and consider joining us every evening as we journey through this book of Acts. And for those who have been together, we've seen the hand of God, we've heard what He is doing, we have experienced His power, we've read the many things. And yesterday we came to the end of the largest, the longest narrative in the book of Acts where God was showing clearly that He does not play favorites, he does not condone prejudice and is calling all of us to love and to accept everyone as he does. Tonight we are going to continue with the remaining portion of Acts chapter 11. We are going to come to the end of chapter 11 tonight as we get ready for chapter 12 tomorrow. Before we begin, let's go ahead and read chapter 11, Acts chapter 11 verse 19 through 30. If you have your Bible, you can read along. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 30. And the word of the Lord says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and encouraged them all that with purpose of her they shall continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it by the elders, and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Father, we invite you tonight. As we study your word, we ask for understanding. We ask that you may enable us by your grace to hear you speaking to our hearts. Feed us, O oh God, as we look up to you. We pray that you may bless not only the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of your word, but also the doing of your word. Mm -hmm. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Due to the ongoing persecution, we are told that a lot of people were displaced. They moved from Jerusalem and they went to the diaspora. You will call them refugees. In modern day times, they will be migrating to a foreign country and they will be seeking for asylum due to religious persecution. Jesus had told the disciples that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, in Judea, and all over the world. Some of them went willingly, but others went because of persecution. 
as the enemy persecuted them as he wanted to discourage them and to diminish their numbers. They spread out and whichever place they went, the Bible says, they continued to preach the name of Jesus. Whenever they went, wherever they settled, they had the name of Jesus on their tongues. And I can imagine them moving on and opening up churches, opening up ministries, having their own places of worship. It sounds much like what happened in the United States, in our history in this country. As immigrants from Europe, from Asia, from Africa came and settled in the United States, they not only established their own businesses, they not only congregated in various areas, but they also opened up ministries, churches, and places of worship. But here we see a dimension that should give us some food for thought. It certainly did for me. The Bible says in verse 19 that those who came and were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And Antioch seems to be the focus of this passage. Here in verse 19, it says that they preach the word to no one but the Jews only. These were men and women from Jerusalem. They were converts from Judaism. And they came maybe with their preconceived notion. And this is actually a very interesting sentence right here after having listened to this huge passage on how God wants the message to be preached to everyone. We find this when they got to Antioch, when they got to the diaspora, they preached, they ministered to no one but to the Jews only. They were exclusive. They did not preach to other people. They were just focused on themselves. Now the question comes to you and I. Why did they do so? Was it a question of language barrier? And if it was a question of language barrier, hadn't the Holy Spirit come and wasn't he given just for this particular reason so that he could help handle issues of language barrier? Was it the issue of ministering to only those they were comfortable with? Or was it the issue of starting from the known to the unknown, that charity begins from home? I do not know the answer to that question. I do not want even to think about the issue of maybe prejudice or they were not willing to spread the good news of salvation to other people. But this comes to us, it brings a question to you and I. Do we feel more comfortable to ministering to people who are like us only? Is our ministry, is our service, is our church even restricted to people who are just like us? But in verse 20, we find another group. They were more inclusive. The Bible says, but some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist, preaching the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord for these people. They went, they were inclusive. They preached Jesus to everyone who was able to listen. The Hellenistic Jews, these were the people who were exposed to Greco-Roman culture. And I want to submit to you that preaching to these people is a little bit more difficult than preaching to the Jews only. They were exposed they had assimilated the Greco-Roman culture. They had different ways of doing things. They had adopted a different lifestyle. And so it was difficult to minister to them. But the second group, which was more inclusive, was willing to do the difficult work. Brothers and sisters, the challenge is for you and I. That even when we find it difficult to minister to the people who have adopted a culture that is different from ours. That when we find people who have assimilated to the culture, the prevailing, the dominant culture. That even when we find it difficult to speak to people like those, we should, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be still willing to be inclusive. 
Because the message is to be preached to everyone. The Bible says the hand of the Lord was with them. Whatever they did, God gave them success because of the hand of the Lord that was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. The scripture talks about the hand of the Lord or the hand of God. Over 122 passages in scripture talk about the hand of God. I don't know when you hear about the hand of God, what comes to your mind. For those who like soccer, for those who like the history of soccer, maybe what you recall is that moment in 1986 World Cup when the star player Diego Maradona of Argentina scored against England with a decisive but illegal handball. When the ball was kicked, he jumped up. And if you're not careful, you will think that he just kicked the ball using his head. But his hand also was involved in it. And later on, when they came to review, it was too late. But that moment, that goal is called the hand of God goal. But in scripture, the hand of God is a metaphor for the power of God. The hand of the Lord or the hand of God, when you read through and if you have time, you can go and look at every one of these 122 passages. Several things will come up. I just want to share with you maybe one or two of those. The hand of God is generous. It's open and generous. Psalm 145 verse 16 says, You open your hand and you satisfy the desires of every living thing. Psalm 145 verse 16. And the metaphor here talks about the generosity of God who opens up his hand to satisfy our desires, to fulfill our desires, every living thing. Oh, how I pray that tonight you'll be satisfied with the open hand of God. That even as you pray, as you call upon the name of God, you'll pray and say, oh, may your hand be upon me. May the hand of God be upon my family. May the hand of God be upon my loved ones. May the hand of God be upon all of us because he not only opens his hand to satisfy the desires, but also we find the hand of the Lord is powerful upon those who look up to him. You can go and have a study on the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra talks about many instances of the hand of God. He knew that the hand of the Lord was upon him. And he says in Ezra chapter 7 verse 28, Because the hand of God, the, the, the hand of the Lord my God was on me, I took courage and gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. He talks about the gracious hand of God in chapter 8 verse 18. He talks about the gracious hand of our God is on everyone who looks up to him. Verse 22, chapter 8 verse 22. And chapter 8 verse 31, he talks about the hand of our God was on us and he protected us from our enemies and the bandits along the way. But I love the hand of the Lord which gives us strength. In Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10. Where that powerful encouraging promise says to us. Do not fear for I am with you. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. Do not be worried for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The hand of God gives us strength. And in this instance. It is the hand of God that gave success to these people. When they preached, when they taught about Jesus, the hand of the Lord accompanied them. The Bible says in verse 22 that when the news of this thing came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. You may not understand at first why they wanted to send Barnabas. But as it is with every situation, they wanted to check that new movement, check it out, see whether they were doing the right thing, whether they were preaching the right doctrine, and they chose the right man for the job, and it was Barnabas. When he came, the Bible says, verse 23, he came and he saw the grace of God, and he was glad, hallelujah. He is a man who was not jealous. 
He is a man who was not envious. He is a man who was not seeking to take credit. He came, he saw what these people are doing. He came, he saw how they had preached. He came and witnessed the grace of God that in spite of their mistakes, even those who were exclusive, the grace of God was still abundant. The hand of the Lord was on them and he was glad. And I love this man Barnabas. I love Barnabas in the book of Acts. Not much is said about him. But we see a man who walked with God, a man who was pure in his heart. You see, many people would be envious, especially in ministry. You recall that time when, when um, Jethro came to his son-in-law Moses and told him, what you're doing is too much for you. You're going to wear yourself out. Therefore, go ahead and choose people, 70 men, on whom the Holy Spirit of God can be poured out on. And Moses went and chose these people. And on that time when they needed to be gathered together before the sanctuary, so God will speak with them and the Spirit of God will be poured out on them. Two of them were missing. They were late to come. But the, when, when the decisive moment happened, the Holy Spirit was poured on the 68 who were there. And someone came running and said, Moses, there are two men who are prophesying in the camp. Should we tell them to stop? Moses said, oh, how I wish that everybody will prophesy. Oh, how I wish this would be our attitude. That when we see God blessing a ministry, we will join in, in rejoicing and be glad. That in spite of the ongoing competition that is now in the ministry of God, that people competing, ministries competing, ministers competing, choirs competing, whatever competing is not about any one of us. It's about Jesus. Barnabas came. He saw the grace of God and he was glad. He moved on. The Bible says he encouraged them. I've told you again, I love this man, Barnabas. He was a son of encouragement. He had the gift of encouragement. And every now and then, whenever Barnabas shows up, we see encouragement following him. Friends, this is not a small thing. This is a serious thing. We find the Holy Spirit inspiring Luke to write about encouragement over and over again. I've already spoken about this, but I'm just going to ask you one question. Are you a son or a daughter of encouragement? When people speak with you, when they interact with you, do they leave that conversation more encouraged or discouraged? God wants us to be encouragers. His character, his description is given. The Bible says he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and many people were added to the Lord. Barnabas understood that he could not do the work by himself. He went and sought for another person, Saul of Tarsus. He told Saul, come join me. There's great work to be done. You may not have been accepted in Jerusalem, but there's God's work to be done in Antioch. And he went, and you see, Barnabas could have just stayed there, say, hey, God is blessing. Let me just hang out here. Let me just be here. And then I can take all the credit. But he knew, no, 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 no. We need to work together. He went and called Saul of Tarsus. Come on. The Bible says when he had found him, he brought him to enter this work to do here. So it was that for a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And what happened? The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Prior to this, this Christians or this movement had different names. In Acts chapter 1 verse 15, they were called disciples. In Acts chapter 5 verse 14, they are called believers. In Acts chapter 5 verse 32, they are called witnesses. In Acts chapter 6, verse 3, they are called brothers. In Acts chapter 9, verse 2, they are called followers of the way. In Acts chapter 9, verse 13, they are called the saints. But it is here that for the first time, they get the name Christians, followers of Jesus, followers of Christ the Messiah. I'd like to ask you the question, what do people call you? 
What is your name? What is your reputation? A certain minister, a friend of mine, was sharing with me one time when he went to visit one of the church members at their place of work. And so he got to the receptionist and he introduced himself, said, I'm pastor so-and-so, and I am here to see so-and-so. And they work here. So the receptionist said, um, why do you want to see them? And the pastor said, well, they are my church members. <laughs> and the receptionist was shocked. And asked the question, wait, they go to church? They go to your church? Is that person a Christian? And that was enough. That was enough to know what kind of person they were in their place of work. Who are you? Who are you? If your colleagues were to describe you, who are you? If your family could describe you, who are you? Who are you when you're in a place when people do not know you. If your fellow motorist on the highway could describe you, who are you? Who are you? If you're anonymous commenting on social media or any other place where you know that people cannot know who you are, mm -hmm. but heaven knows who you are, who are you? When that final report is being written in heaven, when the angels are sending the report in heaven, what are they writing? What are they saying? Who, who are you? Who are you? When you're speaking in a place where no one else can hear, who are you? As we come to the conclusion, we learn about their change. Verse 27 and 28 and 29 and 30, we see a prophet who came up, his name was Agabus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, he predicted that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world. In our situation today, we will say there was going to be a great pandemic. There was going to be a great crisis and he gave them an opportunity to prepare. The Bible says that the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this is the mark of a Christian. In much the same way the hand of God is open and is generous to us, God is not going to come down and bring whatever you need, whatever I need, whatever my neighbor needs, God is going to use you. God is going to use all of us to be his feet and his hands. And I want to finish with this very positive note. I just want to thank God for our brothers and sisters in Maranatha for your generosity. From the time you were told there is a need for the Good Samaritan Fund, there is a need to minister to those who are in our midst, to those uh, who are with us, to those who may not have much. The hand of the Lord has been upon all of you. And because of your generosity, God's people have been served. How I pray that we'll continue with that heart of being generous. Generous towards God, generous towards one another, generous not only with money, but also generous with love, with kindness, generous with good words, generous with acts of service, generous with our time, generous with everything. Because that is what God has called us to be, Christians, especially in these end times. Our time is past gone, but I want to ask you a few questions for you to consider. I've already asked you the question, what is your name? What are you known for? Are you generous? Are you inclusive or exclusive? When that final report has been written by the angels, what do they say about you? Are you a son or a daughter of encouragement? Or do you 
uh, trade, your currency is discouragement and negativity. May the grace of God through the power of his Holy Spirit give you the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of joy, the, the fruit of patience, long-suffering, kindness, love, and peace as we minister to other people. Please join us tomorrow as we look at chapter 12 to see what else will be going on. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for teaching us through your word. Thank you, O oh God, for showing us what we need to do. Help us by your grace to be faithful to you. Help us to be obedient. And help us, O oh God, to think long term. Because soon you're coming to take us home. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.